Well, good morning, brother and sister. This is really a new experience for me to ever preach from home, sitting down in front of a computer and uh, try to share the Word of God with you all. Uh, well, I guess, you know, that is a new normal. Uh, without knowing uh, how long would this whole thing last, uh, I guess God allowed uh, this thing happen so that we can experience uh, what it is like to be truly a church. A church is no longer a building. Well, actually, church is not a building or an address, but church is a community of believers or disciples of Christ coming together to worship Him well, whether in a building or in cyberspace or uh, like this. Uh, but anyway, uh, but as a church, we come together uh, to worship, but at the same time to hold each other accountable, to, uh, to conduct ourselves, to live out uh, a, the gospel or our new life in Christ. Uh, as I study the text that uh, was assigned to me uh, on 1 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, the Lord just reminded me uh, one thing, uh, which is as contagious as the virus that we are encountering right now. And uh, I call this a Corinthian virus. Uh, if we are talking about dealing uh, with a crisis as a nation, uh, Paul was dealing uh, with a crisis in church. And uh, there's a lot of details that we don't know about uh, what was actually happening uh, and at that time in the church of Corinth. Uh, but anyway, uh, the key issue is uh, why the church uh, become silent or why the church was indifferent uh, towards an individual which is very immoral, but at the same time brag about the immorality that uh, that he did. And um, so what kind of um, uh, discipline, church discipline, or any kind of discipline that the, that the uh, Corinthian church uh, practice, we don't know. But someone may say, hey, you know, uh, what's wrong? You know, why, why it matters as long as, you know, uh, both parties uh, consent to do anything they want, you know, and we should not be judgmental and we should not judge others' privacy. If it's, you know, a private matter, then uh, didn't Jesus come to uh, offer us salvation, forgiveness, and second chance? Then why, why do we bother with other people who may practice something that we consider immoral? Yes, we should not be judgmental. That's true. But our new life in Christ does involve a new, renewed value systems and a Christ-like conduct. Our newfound freedom uh, is not supposed for us to uh, indulge ourselves in doing whatever we want. No, this is not the case. God expects all the follower of Christ, for those who claim to be follower of Christ, and for those who, uh, who say we have a new life in Christ, and we're supposed to lead a holy life. Just like you know the uh, the scripture say uh, in First Peter chapter one fourteen to sixteen, our new normal in Christ is as obedient children. Do not conform to the evil desire you had when you live in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. And because of that, we want to hold each other accountable to conduct a life that we reveal the glory of God. So we need to be watchful. Do not yield to peer group pressure. And this is very common. I mean, for a lot of young people uh, in our audience, uh, got to be careful. Do not do something that you deep down inside, you know that 
you're not supposed to do or you don't want to do. But then because you want to uh, gain the acceptance of uh, some cool guys or cool girl in your school or, you know, and at work or whatever, and then you just follow whatever uh, your friends do. And this is like a contagious virus that could pass on to others. If you try to, you know, uh, do something uh, to please other people or to uh, yield to the peer group pressure, others will follow. And then pretty soon, you know, they will affect the whole community, you know, the entire class, you know, or, or everybody. Uh, nobody will say no and nobody, dare, you know, dare to say no because they want to be accepted. So we got to be careful. So beware of this, what I call uh, Corinthian virus, okay? Uh, let's go to the text and uh, see uh, what was going on at that time. And, uh, and uh, we start with uh, chapter 5, 1 to 2, and we skip a few verses because it's too long. But let us read together, shall we? It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that even pagans do not tolerate. A man is sleeping with his father's wife and you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put out of your fellowship the, the man who has been doing this? And then we skip a verses. Hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. Wow, you know, it, 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 isn't it amazing? You know, someone sleep with his father's wife. I mean, apparently, there is not the mother, uh, maybe a stepmother. Uh, so, and then after you're doing all this, in, and this guy even bragged about what he did within the community of the church. Wow, I can't believe that happened. And then apparently, uh, the church probably did not say anything. They're just being tolerant. They feel like, oh, yeah, that's okay. You know, uh, there's their business as long as, you know, they're both of them, you know, the stepmother probably, you know, and the men consent to do this, you know, who, who are we to judge them? You know, just like what I said earlier. And so we will say, that's okay, you know, it's, you know, uh, just between them. But then, you know, uh, if we allow this happen, if we allow this kind of practice continue to exist in the community of faith, and as I said earlier, what is what is church? A church is a community of believers coming together to worship God, to offer ourselves as living sacrifice to God and hold each other accountable to conduct a life that is worthy of the gospel, worthy of of what Christ did on the cross for us to live a holy life. And uh, and this thing probably is not happening in the church of Corinth. And uh, that's why uh, that's why Paul has to write this letter uh, to remind the church, you got to be careful. And then continue on verse 6 to 8. Your, boat, your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old bread leavened with malice with, and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Yes, we got to be careful uh, because a little, a little ease will uh, affect the whole, the whole bread. And, um, and that is why we got to be watchful about this. We think a little thing or maybe, well, just their business. But sometimes if we are not careful, whatever we think is so-called private, may end up affecting the whole community because we are being careless and we are being, you know, nice to one another. Sometimes uh, we have to stand on the ground and say, no, no, this is not right. And we have to uh, speak out again. It's just like, you know, 
we, when we see that it is a virus, you know, that's taking place, somebody has to blow the whistle, even though it may cost uh, something, you know, but then, you know, a whistleblower is needed in order to stop some situation continue to affect the whole community. And uh, so uh, beware of this. Now, when we talk about sin, well, there's nothing under the sun anyway. Ever since, you know, Adam and Eve sinned, and uh, it just continued. Uh, we call it, you know, uh, our original sin. Well, the original sin actually is our rebellious. Our original sin is our self-centeredness. And that's never changed. We just feel like passing on from one generation to another. From Adam and Eve, uh, and then they pass it on to many, many generations. You know, we're born with that kind of self-centeredness, you know, just like a baby, you know, when they, when they were born, you know, because of their needs, they cry out, they cry out until their parents uh, would give attention to them. So we, uh, since birth, we become so self-centered. We want everybody, the whole world, attend to our needs, but not on the other way around. I don't see any baby who consider the, uh, the the needs of their parents and say, oh, my parents may be too tired. I should not cry at night so that I could leave, uh, let my my parents have a good night's sleep, you know. No, baby will not do that. Baby will just cry, you know, uh, when they need to, uh, need to change diaper or when they need food. They will just cry until, you know, the someone will attend to their needs, then they will stop. So the same thing, you know, uh, this is our problem. The problem of our humanity is that we are so self-centered. So I call it narcissism or self-centeredness. It's the root of all sins. And, uh, and that is our problem. If we are not paying attention, uh, then we would just say, hey, this is my privacy, you know, and everybody say this is our privacy. Everybody say, you know, uh, this is my own need. And so I'm justified. Uh, uh, my need is greater than everybody's need. So, you know, I don't care what you think, you know, as long as I have a need and I want this, then, uh, then I will get it now uh, in whatever cost. And sometimes it will create a big problem. Uh, in any community, not let alone a Christian community. So Christianity uh, is not just about moral behavior, that's what we know. Uh, we are not promoting a list of do's and don'ts and say, oh, you got to do this and that in order to be saved. No, while we are sinners, Jesus died for us. And so we are being saved, not because we are good enough. We can never do enough in order to earn our salvation. The salvation of Christ is given to us for free. But then this new life in Christ also come with a regeneration. And that's what Christ offer us. Not just, you know, a, a guarantee eternity in, in heaven. So, you know, when we accept Jesus, so that now we have, you know, a ticket a, to go to heaven. Not only that, but we, Jesus offer us a new life, a new life, a new transformation, a new regeneration. That thing will happen when we receive Jesus because it's not by our own might that we can conduct a holy life. It's by the presence of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit. It's not us, you know. We, we are weak. Who, who what can we do to, to change ourselves? Not, what, what can we do to, to observe uh, a whole list of do and stone? You know, even the, the Pharisees, you know, and Sadducees and the priests, and nobody can really, uh, by their own might or by their, their own uh, effort, to lead a life that will earn God's acceptance. No, God acceptance is just offered to us. Yes, now we have a new life. We are covered by the blood of Christ. We have a new life in Christ. At the same time, the Holy Spirit comes. And that's what the work of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit dwells within us. 
and give us the ability, not only direct us and tell us, remind us about the teaching of Christ. Yes, this is, this is the work of the Holy Spirit to remind us about the word of Christ. But at the same time, the Holy Spirit empower us, give us the strength. Yeah, we know what is right and wrong sometimes. Uh, we know what we should do and uh, we know uh, what is uh, truth and what is false. But the thing is, we don't have the ability. We don't have the strength to do it. And God knows well. He knows that even you desire to do good, but sometimes you don't have the strength to do it. And that's why you know, the Holy Spirit comes and offers us the strength, empower us so that we can conduct a new life in Christ. So Christianity is more than just do's and don'ts. Christianity is, is not just being moralist, but, uh, but Christianity is about transformation from inside out. But, that, but then it involves death, death to our old self, so that the Holy Spirit to can come in, become the Lord of our life, become the master, okay? And, and uh, enable us to live out a Christ-like character within us, within you. So look at uh, what uh, C.S. Lewis said. And he said the purpose of the church was to draw people to Christ and make them like Christ. If the church is not doing this, then all the cathedrals, beautiful building, clergy, pastors, missions, sermons, even the Bible are a waste of time. And it's true. Uh, we focus on just two things. Draw people to Christ, not by our own strength, not, not try to convince people, not, not hit, hit people uh, on the head with the Bible. No, 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 not doing that. But uh, conduct yourself uh, that is worthy of the gospel, you know, and attract people attention, not really purposely attract people attention, but when you conduct yourself differently from your crowd, just not, you know, not yielding, not yielding to, to peer group pressure, for example. Then people will ask, you know, how could you do that? And uh, so then we will come to you and ask you, what, what's your secret? How, how come you, you can uh, stand firm in your own principle, you know, and stand, stand firm on your own value system without yielding to the, the pressure uh, from the community? And then you can tell them, not because of me, I can't do it, but because the one who lives inside me, which is the Holy Spirit. And then you testify your new life in Christ. And then when you do that, you attract people not to you, but to Christ. And not only that, when this person comes to Christ, and then they, you need to, we need to help them, uh, disciple them, teach them, uh, be, uh, and help them to become Christ-like. So, so the whole thing is when you are, you, you you are become Christ-like, then your life will be attractive to the world. Either attract people at uh, attention or attract people criticism, whatever way. But somehow, that is what we are called to do. And uh, and so the we got to be careful when uh, in the in the book of Matthew. Uh, uh, Philippians, I'm sorry. Uh, in the book of Philippians, chapter 3, 17 to 19, uh, Paul said, Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For I, as, as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemy of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stom stomach. And their glory is in the shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. Now, pay attention to what Paul said right here in the, in the book of Philippians. He is calling the disciples of Jesus, like you and me. Okay, be careful uh, not to just listen to some of the 
great preacher or great great teacher who tell you what to do and what not to do. But watch them. Look at their life. Look at their example. And then that is what the, the world is looking at us too. And look at their example, how they conduct their life. And, and because some people uh, uh, can, can, can preach a Greek sermon, some people can, can teach, you know, the Bible, but yet, you know, their lives does not live out what they teach. And, and as a matter of fact, you know, uh, in, in the church of uh, Philippians, uh, uh, Philippi, the, uh, Paul was cautioned the disciples to watch out because there are some people who claim to be Christian, but yet, you know, they live their lives, become enemy of the cross. Wow. I mean, it's, it's really crazy, isn't it? You know, these people who pay a high price to become a Christian, yet when they become Christians, they conduct their life like enemies of the cross. What was going on? Really, what was going on here? And uh, the enemy of the cross, I would say, is like uh, pluralism. And um, because uh, that means, you know, all things pluralism means, you know, uh, all religion are the same. Um, all roads go to heaven, that kind of thing. But no, uh, in what we believe, there's only one way, not any religious, any religion or any way can lead us to heaven. We believe there's only one way to go to heaven. And this is what Jesus said. Uh, I am the way. Jesus is the only way. So when we believe in pluralism, means any anything, any value system, anything can go. As long as you are okay, other people are okay, then you just conduct yourself whatever you want. And if you believe that, that always lead to heaven, then you become the enemy of the cross. Then why Jesus uh, had to die on the cross? If that's, if Jesus was not the only way, why he paid a high price for doing so? Because he recognized that there is no other way. You know, the only way is that the, the, the Holy Lamb died for us. Only when Jesus died for us, on the cross, pay our price that we can become a Christian and we can find a new way to draw close to God. And uh, and when Paul said, you know, God is their stomach, that means, you know, materialism. Um, because all this is all they want, you know, the, the stomach, what the food, you know. Uh, we are craving for food, you know, we Chinese, you know, uh, love food and uh, we almost can eat anything we want and uh, and that's a, become our problem. And so uh, when God is your stomach, that means, you know, you don't care about, you know, anything as long as, you know, you have uh, food, your favorite food on the table, that's what you want and food become your priority. God, food become your God, and that's a problem. And glory is the shame, means, you know, it's the ethical uh, relativism. That means, you know, anything goes. And uh, even when we think, oh, that is my privacy, that is my lifestyle, you know, your why church, you bother with my lifestyle, this is my personal lifestyle. And these, these things that, you know, this lifestyle, you know, uh, that means my freedom. And you should not come in to tell me uh, what, how to live my life. And so if we think that is the case, sometimes our shameful lifestyle uh, will affect the glory of God. This, you know, we think that is the glory, but actually uh, that is our shame. And the mindset on earthly things is... Uh, it's like consumerism. I mean, the the whole world is trying to sell us a new thing and ask us to buy this and ask us to buy that, you know, and, and, and to offer us, affect us to always think about, you know, things on earth. And so, uh, and this is all the things that are leading us away, away from God and away from what kind of life that we're supposed to, 
to live. John Stark, you know, uh, one of our uh, well-known uh, writer and pastor in the evangelical church, uh, warned the church against all this uh, pluralism, materialism, ethical realism, and narcissism. And uh, in his book, uh, his last book, uh, <coughs> he died uh, probably two years ago. And uh, John Stock wrote a small book, on, uh, his, like his last word to the evangelical churches, the radical disciples. And in his book, he just left his last word to all evangelical church believers. Be careful. These are the things that will affect us, that will take away our influence in the world. And uh, in Second Timothy, Paul also remind uh, the, the church, uh, remind Timothy, his disciples, and also the church that uh, he pastors, that, but mark this, he said, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lover of themselves, lover of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lover of the good, uh, treacherous, rash, you know, rash and conceited, lover of pleasure rather than lover of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. See, you know, all these, you know, just talk about self-loving, narcissism, talk about self-centeredness. And so this is contagious. You know, self-centeredness is really a contagious thing because, you know, when you become self-centered, then you affect people, oh, yeah, you, you like, like, like that, I'm like that too, you know, just like, you know, uh, if, if we are uh, uh, cautious for our own, uh, uh, always uh, uh, fight for your own uh, needs or your own rights, then you will affect everybody who do the same thing. And, uh, but then, you know, uh, we need that. We know that in order to deal with this, I call it the core virus, narcissism. Uh, the only way to deal with it, according to Paul in Col Colossians 3, 5 to 10, he said, put to death. The only way is to put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. See? Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now, you, well, I should say we, must also rid ourselves of such, of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of his creator. See, this put off and put on, as seems like, you know, an easy thing, just like you know, changing our clothes. Okay, put off the old clothes and put on a new clothes. But it, it may take a whole lifetime, honestly. I've been a Christian for 40 some years. And, uh, and every day I'm still learning to put off my old self. I have to be consciously remind myself that it's the old self. I need to put it off. It doesn't belong to me anymore because I have a new nature. I'm a new person in Christ. And so uh, I need to remind myself and uh, teach my soul really to put it off so that I can put it on. It, nothing comes natural. Our natural, natural self is sinful. Our natural self is uh, sinful. Uh, self-centered so if you are not conscious and remind yourself though no this is not right then we got in trouble and uh, let me give you this uh, uh, this comparison and and try to what we try to put on here put on godliness and uh, what I call it devout living but not putting on a, a 
a religious, you know, self. See, that's not what Jesus. Jesus did not come to, to, to build a religion. Uh, we try to, you know, build a religion for Jesus, but Jesus never came to build a religion. But Jesus come came to to uh, remind us uh, to rebuild our relate our, our relationship with God. And so, what we want to focus is godliness or devout living, but not just a religious passion, okay? Uh, when I compare these two kind of life, uh, you would say the religious passion is just like the Pharisees, you know, uh, when Jesus came and he, he criticized a lot about these religious leaders. And we have to be careful, you know, because, you know, we could easily be, become one of them. And, um, and I need to, as I said earlier, I need to caution uh, re remind myself well, I, I need to be cautious uh, uh, and and uh, to reflect uh, daily about the kind of life that I'm conducting. And uh, the first kind is you know the religious passion uh, uh, is an outward pretension. I try to put on a nice self, you know, or you know a holy than thou type type of person. No, this is not our word. And devout living uh, focus on the inner awareness. Am I aware of the kind of life uh, that I have in Christ? This precious, this precious life uh, that Jesus offered me, you know. Uh, and uh, I need to constantly, and that's why we encourage you to do devotion. Devotion is not just 15 minutes or 30 minutes type of reading the Bible and doing uh, some singing that kind of thing is is actually the devotion the 30 50 minutes or 30 minutes of devotion actually is a warm up exercise to to remind us that yeah you know I want to start a new day and then on this new day you know how do how should I conduct my myself uh in in the world and so uh as we read the bible you know the bible remind us who we are now in Christ and then when we go out to the world, after we uh, finish our devotion, after we say our prayer, and then we'll go into the world and we become watchful about the kind of life that we are about to live, okay? So the inner awareness is what a devout living, uh, a devout person uh, supposed to do. The, the second one is avoid violation. These religious people, uh, concern so much as oh I sh I cannot do this I cannot do that. No, a devout living is pursuing what is abundant living. So you pursue something good, just as I w we always say. You know, before you can say no to what is not right, you have to first say yes to what is right. So you have to say yes to Jesus, because before you can say no to the world. So what we want to focus is not all these things that we are not supposed to do. You know, sometimes when you put too much effort to paying attention to all these you are not supposed to do, you're giving these things too much attention. And so try not to focus on them. Yes, you know, those are the things that we are not supposed to do, but focus on more on what are some of the things that that is desirable. What are some of the things that God wants us to enjoy? There are a lot of things that God wants us to enjoy. This new life in Christ, you know. So when we focus on the abundant life that we have, all the goodness, you know, all the beauty that we have in Christ, then this becomes dim. Then we no longer really pay attention to these, and 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 this is no longer. Uh, we no longer need an effort trying to avoid doing something which is not right, but rather we choose to do what is good then we become we have uh, we we have the strength to say no to the all these and uh religious people uh want to have quick fix mentality want to be fast you know i go to attend church you know and afterward you know then i am acceptable to to god you know he thinks that uh this is what uh our life in christ is all about uh is something quick. We hope you know we can find uh, a drug that can we can take and take a pill, and then we become uh, super Christian. No, we don't. We can't have that. So for a devout person, 
uh, they know that it takes time to bear fruit. It takes time to be holy. It takes time, you know, to grow as a, a person. And so we we don't seek uh, uh, a a quick uh, or a, a fast pass, you know, to to become uh, where we want to go. It takes time. Okay, we deal with that. And then the fourth thing is, you know, uh, a religious person just seek uh, religious feeling. Now, feeling is okay. I mean, yeah, we enjoy worship. You know, I don't know about you. You know, I always enjoy worshiping with uh, our fellow uh, brothers and sisters. You know, those are good experiences. You know, we come together to worship God. You know, we, we, we like, you know, a, a, have a, a first taste of what it's like. Uh, to worship God in eternity. That is our, uh, like a rehearsal. Rehearsal of what we will be like in the future. And uh, in that day when we can all coming together, all, all race, all people group, all nations come together to worship Jesus. Yeah, and uh, we have a little experience of that now. Uh, but then that feeling uh, could be deceiving too. And because, you know, when we seek that feeling, when Sometimes we don't have that feeling, and then we feel like, oh, we are all alone, and we, we and then the feeling could deceive us, and so we're gonna be careful. A devout person, uh, focus more on renewing our mindset daily, change our mindset because a lot of times Satan uh, deceive us, uh, uh, within us, within our mind, and so uh, give us some wrong fake news, <laughs> or fake, uh, 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 false hope, uh, but not uh, 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 complete truth, uh, half truth or whatever. So we got to discern. We know how to discern what is right. And the way we do it is not by our own might. Just go back to the Bible and then uh, read the Bible. And from the Bible, we, we uh, use the Bible as our guide to discern what is right and what is wrong. And then we develop a mindset, a new mindset in Christ. And last but not the least is, you know, the religious people boast their status. See, look at who I am, you know, I'm holier than you are and I'm better than you are. You know, you non-Christian, you know, you are doomed to hell. Hey, I am different. No, that kind of attitude need to remove. You know, Jesus does not like those kind of attitude. That's why he criticized the religious leader. You think you are greater. You think you are you, you you are more honorable. You think you are better, but no, you are just you know fellow sinners. You know, you are redeemed. We are nothing than more than a redeemed sinners. You know, uh, just like uh, Paul said. You know, uh, he he said that he was the chief of all sinners. If Paul said he was the chief of all sinners and who I am, you know, I feel like, you know, I'm even worse than him in, in many folds. So with that kind of attitude, I'm nothing without Christ. I, I'm, I'm the worst of all sinners without Christ. If we have attitude like that, I would say, you know, that's the right way. That's the way. Humility is a way lead us to God because God accept those who humble himself before him. And uh, and so a real devout person is practice self-denial. Self-denial. I think that is really uh, the bottom line of our Christian living is we daily deny ourselves, our deny our rights, deny, deny our self, our flesh desire. And when we do that, then we allow the Holy Spirit to come in and to transform us from within. Only when we yield ourselves to Him and say, Jesus, I accept you as my Savior and the Lord of my life. You are the Lord. You are the Master. I'm your servant. I'm your slave. With that kind of attitude, daily come before Him and we reaffirm that He is God, He is the Lord of our lives, then the Holy Spirit will work within us and make ourselves, make our life to become holy and to become a uh, acceptable sacrifice to Him. 
And that's why uh, what we need to pay attention is that our life should be an example to others. Just as uh, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. This is what we need to learn and this is what we need to do. Well, I hope you are still with me. Uh, and uh, I hope that uh, with, uh, with what Paul said in uh, the First Corinthians chapter 5, hope that will not happen to Cumberland. Uh, if does, if there are one, if they, you heard of some people who brag about uh, what they did wrong, I hope that uh, we'll pray for them. But at the same time, we should stand up and say, tell the person, no, this is not right. You should not boast about what you did wrong. Uh, you should humble before God and repent. And we should help each other. We are not just using words to accuse others or to judge others, but you use our life to conduct ourselves as an example. Let people see how you conduct yourself uh, instead of going around and, and tell people what they did wrong. But the focus more on what I have to yield myself to Him so that uh, my life could be an acceptable uh, offering to Jesus. May God bless you all.